Good morning. Good morning. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we just ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear this morning as we turn to your word. Um, give us wisdom and insight. Help us to have our hearts changed more into the likeness of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would open your Bibles, we'll go to Exodus chapter 20. We'll be in the 14th and 15th verses today. Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 14. There should be a Bible in the pew. There's probably one on your smart device. Exodus 20, starting in verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Well, there you have it. Let's go home and have lunch. <laughs> Reportedly, more than half of our nation's men are or have been involved in extramarital affairs. And a third of women in the United States fall into the same classification. It appears that thou shall not commit adultery is indeed a needed statement at this point. No more than at any other point in history, perhaps. We certainly see the real significance in the environment which we are surrounded by. Further, the Christian population can't seem to connect our claim for traditional values with the reality of everyday life in which we live those values out, as some two-thirds of the Christians said that divorce was a reasonable solution to a problem marriage, and 45% of Christians interviewed said that the children produced by unhappy marriages should not serve as a reason to keep that family together. You see, we have Christian parents who on the one hand are extolling virtues of purity and fidelity, and then on the other hand, they themselves cannot live up to these values. They choose not to espouse the things they are preaching, and this devastates and disappoints the very children that they are attempting to rear in the framework of these biblical principles. Now, I find these statistics staggering, and to be honest, quite heartbreaking. And the thing is, that is not even the worst of it. As we continue to look at our culture around us, I read some articles and it talks about polyamory, which is dressed up fancy polygamy, except for without the vows. And this is the uh, practice of sexual relationships with one or more partner within marriage bonds. And it's becoming normalized, even mainstream. It's even in the church. This is appalling. We only need to read the first few chapters of uh, the story of Abram in Genesis to understand how this works out invariably. Uh, as if marriage wasn't hard enough, we now think, well, let's invite new partners <coughs> into this relationship with us. And of course, this isn't new, as I just mentioned, it exists in Genesis, but even in our culture, in the late 60s, Morton Hunt, who is a sociologist, wrote that polygamy seems better suited to the emotional capabilities and requirements of many people, particularly men. It offers renewed excitement and continual expressions of personal rediscovery. It is an answer to the boredom of lifelong monogamy. And we are, by nature, polygamists. But see, the truth is that we are actually, by nature, totally depraved. And rather than indulging in this sexual sin, we ought to accept the lifestyle that is ordained by God's order. So we ought to find ourselves in agreement with God's purpose for marriage, the family and fidelity, living in obedience to God's laws, which calls us to a higher standard, one which we ourselves cannot attain, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can endeavor to walk according to this standard, according to God's laws and not against it. See, modernly, just because folks are consenting adults, it does not mean that it's okay. You see, adultery is breaking a covenant not only that you've made with your spouse, but that you have made with God. And God did not say that you could break this covenant. And as with all sin, sexual sin especially, 
is not only a sin against our own bodies, and in this case our spouse, but it is ultimately a sin against God. And so we see in a reasonably early biblical example, a young man and his boss, his wife, makes a pass at him. And he turns to her and he says, how could I do such a wicked thing against God? Perhaps you are already thinking, oh, that's Joseph. And this is his rejection of Potiphar's wife, which indeed ends up costing him dearly. Yet he well articulates that his sin would be against God. And the psalmist also picks up on this concept in Psalm 51, verse 4. And he says, against you alone I have sinned. I hope that I don't have to work too hard to convince you all that what we're talking about with this commandment, the seventh commandment, is really keeping the sanctity of marriage. Marriage is a divinely ordained institution, and God gave it to humanity from the very beginning. As we look at Adam and Eve who are created, they're together in the garden, the first marriage. And God created Eve to complete Adam. And in union with Adam, she likewise is completed. And the two become one. And without a doubt, the most significant verse in the Bible regarding marriage is that the two become one flesh. I don't want to get bogged down here, but my point is to illustrate the importance of marriage. It is an extremely important institution that is at the heart of our uh, being, culture, family. It's an extremely important institution, and it's a gift from God for humanity. And so this commandment, then, is about keeping it holy, sacred, reverenced, sanctified. And one way we do this is in taking appropriate consideration of how we relate to one another and respond to one another. To become one. This idea of oneness is, in a sense, it's difficult to understand, and yet the implications are clear in many ways. Just as the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, they are of one mind, one will, and one action, and so too in our marriages at the ideal, we are also one, of one mind, will, and action. Now, let us not be foolish in this. Of course, this is the ideal. The reality of putting two human beings in a relationship together is going to cause uh, tension, shall we say. But what we are talking about is having the same mission of looking first to the other for the making of decisions and the going about of family business. As Paul tells us, men are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, sacrificially protecting them, cherishing her, loving her, taking care of her, putting her and the family's needs first. Wives are to love, respect, and obey their husbands. And within this relationship, we get, begin to see quite clearly that when we hurt one's spouse, they're actually hurting themselves. Perhaps one of the worst, if not the worst, offense we can commit against that spouse is that of adultery. And see, in the standard marriage of vows, we propose, we promise until death do us part. And this is a serious commitment. Indeed, this is a covenant before God. And God ordained marriage. He presides over marriage. And it is his desire that the marriage bed be kept pure. And it is essential that the couple understands that they, what they are agreeing to do and what they are agreeing not to do. They have committed themselves to each other for life. Adultery, then, is a betrayal, an intrusion, and a rejection of God's institution, which has been provided for our good. The adulterer separates what God has joined together, and adultery is the severing of a body into two parts. As we read in Paul, if the husband is the head of the marriage and the oneness creates a whole body, then adultery is a decapitation of that body. And while this metaphor is it's an image, it's a spiritual reality. This is how serious adultery is. And of course, this does not mean that God can't or won't or doesn't redeem marriages. He does. He does it all the time. Certainly there are Christians, and non-Christians probably, 
who have chosen to remain married after one spouse or the other was unfaithful. But doubtlessly, this is a long and difficult process. Yet, with the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit, it can happen, it does happen. And so far, we have focused on physical adultery. But what about, as Jesus says in Matthew 5, adultery in the mind or the heart? Matthew 5, 27 reads, You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Well, let me first clarify that Jesus says him, or man, but this is not limited to the males in the room. It goes for females, too. In the same way that Jesus condemns the murder in our hearts, the adultery in our hearts is extremely serious, and we find ourselves in the same predicament, guilty before God. When a man looks at another man's wife with lust, he is an adulterer in God's eyes, and so too a woman who entertains <coughs> lascivious, there's a vocab word for you, thoughts about another woman's husband is also guilty before God. It sounds extreme, and indeed it is, because we are called to be extreme, completely holy, as God is holy, pure, just as God is pure. We are called to maintain purity of heart in order that we be correctly set apart for God. Here, notably, with our bodies. We must therefore discipline ourselves and avoid these occasions for immorality. Solomon has words of advice on this. He says, guard your heart with all vigilance, for from it are the sources of life. Indeed, we see throughout the Bible that what is in our heart becomes our actions. Uh, something I read this week preparing says, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action and reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. How fitting this is. Well, what we may start as having the smallest idea in the back of our minds can easily become a great sin struggle. And to think otherwise is naive. <clears throat> and so with that said, let's talk about what we do about this. There's certainly more things, but we're going to talk about four this morning. When we find ourselves in the position to commit adultery, we may return to our example of Joseph. Run. Turn around and run. When Potiphar's wife got him alone and made her advance, Joseph knew what the right thing to do was. Or maybe he didn't know what the right thing to do was, but he certainly knew what the wrong thing to do was, and he didn't do that. And in the same way, we may not know what the right thing is, but we surely know what the wrong thing is. Here, namely, to commit adultery. Therefore, we do well to run away. I'm reminded of finding Nemo. Swim away, swim away! <laughs> so the fun balloons. For the old people in the room who don't know the movie, they're uh, underwater mines. You see, we don't have anything to prove by keeping ourselves in situations where temptation can emerge and turn into sin. Just flee. Run away. Further, if you get to the point in real life, there's probably been other stops along the way. And so you do well to always be on your guard. And it isn't about being suspicious of another person or thinking that this woman or man has impure intentions towards you. And the number of uh, relationships in which there's infidelity, the number of those where it goes back to, oh, I have no idea how this happened. I never had any intention of, of cheating on my spouse or hurting my family. Or Right, of course you didn't. Uh, but you did not put appropriate boundaries in place. You did not protect your heart. You were naive, and you thought that you were above sin. You see, really, it's about respecting your spouse, but taking God's statutes seriously and understanding that they're there for a reason. It's about respecting that other person's husband or wife and the appropriate boundaries for them. We do well to perhaps never be alone. 
with the opposite sex other than family members. We do well to watch our time at these business lunches and project meetings. We do well to keep our conversations appropriate. We are totally transparent with our own spouses, ensuring that they know who and what and where and when. The point here is to not fall into the trap of thinking that you are above this sin. Of saying, oh, well, I could never cheat on my spouse, never mind all these warning signs that I'm just blatantly running past with my blinders on. More broadly, we do well to remember that God is watching. I think this goes with really all sin struggle, but in general, we remember that God knows when we sit down and stand up and everything else about us, all of our deep thoughts and actions. See, we'll quickly figure out that maybe we do better to behave ourselves. How would you behave if you knew this was the last hour of your life on earth? And then you face God's judgment. What if in that last moments of your life, you find yourself in adultery with somebody else? Mm, how embarrassing. Another way that we do well to resist temptation is by memorizing memorizing the word of God. And the psalmist says, how can a young person stay in the path of purity? By living according to your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so this is exactly what Jesus does as he faces Satan in the wilderness. He quotes scripture to him. I will be the first one to admit I don't necessarily have Bible verses memorized. I can rarely tell you the chapter and verse. I guess it depends on how recently I've read it. But what I can tell you is a great deal of what the Bible has to say and how it works together. And so my point here is twofold. First, we do well to read our Bibles and commit it to our hearts. And if you don't know it word for word, that's okay. And if you can't point to, that's 1 Corinthians 3.16, right? If you can't, that's okay. What is more important is that you know what the Bible says, that you have God's statutes written on your heart. And you also should memorize scripture. The best way to avoid adultery, I think, is probably by surrounding yourself with other Christians. You see, there's safety in numbers. It's when we become isolated that we become easy prey for the enemy. Believers are called to meet together regularly, to encourage one another, to build each other up, to hold one another accountable. I firmly believe that the confession of our temptation to a brother or sister greatly reduces the power of that temptation. I'm not sure why this is. It's my belief that it has to do with bringing things into the light. And the Bible says over and over again that we are to be people of the light, and that sin hides in darkness. So when we confess our sin struggles to our brothers and sisters, I'm not saying in front of the whole church, by the way. I mean, somebody you know and trust who can handle it. But I think in bringing that temptation into the light, it removes the power from it. It brings us into a place where we can be prayed for, when we can be encouraged, when we can be uh, given strategies by our brothers and sisters. You see, we want to hide our sin. We want to try to handle it ourselves. But that is a recipe for disaster. But when we confess our temptation and our sin, we bring ourselves into a place of righteousness with God that we can be supported and built up, prayed for, and encouraged. And that's what the family of God is for. One last thought on this commandment, and that is in keeping marriage sanctified. One of the most important ways we do that is by keeping sex only for marriage. And I'm aware that this is not popular in America these days. I know full well that our culture thinks that it is odd that we Christians find it so important. <clears throat> or at least some of us Christians do. You see, we are to wait until we are ceremonially married to become physically one flesh. I found that uh, Pastor Beck put it in his book very elegantly. He says, I quote, It is quite common today for couples to reverse God's order of things by putting sex before marriage and then reluctantly formalizing their mating habits in a marriage ceremony. That's the end of the quote. This takes what God says is holy and perverts it. It takes a gift that we have been given 
It's been given to us to bring us closer together as husband and wife, as the physical expression of the spiritual reality of two becoming one flesh, and it destroys it. See, it leaves a little part of each partner with the other, and they can never get this back. And this is adultery, because it is being unfaithful to the future spouse. If nothing else, maybe we do well to just be practical and think about what am I bringing with me into my next relationship? What am I asking my partner to accept? What are they bringing into this relationship and what am I willing to accept? Another thing that I hear all the time is, well, we were engaged, we're going to get married really soon, what's the problem? I mean, first of all, God is quite clear on this. He doesn't say, wait until you're engaged and then it's okay. God says, once you're married, the two become one flesh. But also, it's extremely presumptuous of both his mercy and grace, and the fact uh, that you will indeed stay together. The number of people I know who were engaged, and, oh, it's fine, we can have sex, they are not together anymore. It's a lot more than I can count on one hand. Again, it's presumptuous. And it's assuming that God is going to continue to bless your relationship and your marriage, even though you are actively in rebellion against his word. So I hope that you see how important this is. And that, as part of God's law, how important God's law is. And these guidelines for living are crucial. We do ourselves a disservice. Not to mention we are disobeying the creator of the universe when we disregard them. And so adultery is one way in which we steal. This brings us to our next commandment, that we take what doesn't belong to us. And God says, thou shall not steal. This also seems like a pretty straightforward commandment. Don't take what doesn't belong to you. This is a reasonably well agreed upon standard. Most folks in society around us would agree with this notion. And I think Calvin says it very well, you shall not steal. This means to hate all fraud, all wrong, and all extortion that can possibly be done against another's property. Again, Pastor Beg hopefully adds, the Christian needs to be unwavering and unashamed in saying no to theft and yes to honest endeavor. So you are to respect the property of others, whether personal, business, or governmental property. The Bible explains not only that it is wrong to steal, but why. And so let's look at two concepts that are very closely linked. This is first that God establishes the individual right to private property. And this command uh, implies the legitimacy and dignity of possessions lawfully acquired and properly enjoyed. So it's kind of an inverse way of looking at it, right? Thou shall not steal implies that there is somebody else's property for you to steal. And the significance of private personal ownership is found in God's design of humanity. So he gave us an, a desire for the right of exclusive possession. This ties into our dignity. Derek Prime puts it this way, the foundation of the right of property is God's will. Again, Pastor Beck helps explain, the Bible does not forbid the right of private ownership. It establishes it. Uh, James, the author of the letter of James, affirms that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father. Now, that said, that brings us to understand the truth of the other side, is that the individual's right to private property is not absolute, because it is God who gives us all that we have. And God placed Adam in the garden, in Eden, as his steward. Psalm 24, 1 tells us that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. And so the Lord has placed humanity as his steward over his world. And this determines how we view the whole process as God has created us to have personal property while at the same time we are to acknowledge that that property is actually on loan from him. So we are not to steal because when we steal, in addition to offending God's holiness, disregarding his law, it disregards the principle that God gave that to our neighbor. God appointed our neighbor as the steward of that piece of property. And so now understanding that, it's easy for us to pat our bag, selves on the back, 
and say, well, I've never taken anything from my neighbor. Look at how good I am. Let's move on. See, of course, as we've seen in these last several sermons, it is never as cut and dry as this. And the fact is that we break this commandment in a variety of ways. We steal from God when we fail to acknowledge all that we have is his. When we fail to make him Lord of our finances and resources. This means that your truck is yours, indeed. But if your buddy needs help moving his couch, guess what? You're up. <laughs> and glorify God with a good attitude and helping Use your resources. Your bass boat is yours. This is one of my favorite ones. It means I can buy a bass boat. And on Saturday morning, you need a buddy to put them in that seat so you can witness to them. Your friend who needs a place to stay for a little while. Why look there. You have a guest bedroom or a guest house or a couch to sleep on. I think we have now discovered how God is going to meet that person's needs by you using the resources that he's given you correctly. And so when we don't honor him in these ways, we are stealing from God. And take it one step further, it is true there is no New Testament requirement of the tithe, but the biblical precedent is clear that we are to give to the church and to direct our finances and resources in ways that further the kingdom. To serve those who are in need and to glorify our Father in heaven. And so you've heard me say it before, let me give you the whole illustration today. A guy needed spiritual counsel, and so he calls the pastor, and an appointment was made. And before the pastor hangs up with the guy, he says, hey, also make sure you bring your checkbook. And the guy says back, well, I didn't know I needed to pay for this. And the pastor says, oh, you don't need to pay me. I just need to see where your priorities are. Because we all know very well that where our money goes is where our priorities are. And so as we've discussed the obvious ways of stealing, we clearly see that we wouldn't sneak in and take our neighbor, neighbor's TV. We wouldn't go to Walmart and help ourselves to a new bike. And what we want from Walmart anyway, start paddling down the road and we all fall off. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, there are other ways in which we steal that are a little more subtle or indirect. Employers steal from their employees when they don't pay them a fair wage or when they inflate the price of their goods and services beyond what is reasonable. The biblical model shows that in buying and selling, we do not take advantage of others. Further, we steal from our employers when we goof off at work. We find excuses to be doing anything except the task we are given. We steal time, which is our wages, by playing around on Facebook while we're in the restroom instead of returning to our desk. We further steal from our employers when we pad our expense accounts, claim unreasonable expenses for reimbursement, and let our office supplies somehow end up in our children's backpacks or in our own offices. I once heard a pastor say that you, uh, if you even take one paper clip from work for personal use, that you have broken this commandment. We steal when we borrow books Clothing, DVDs, what's a DVD? Tools, so forth, and don't return them. I wonder if y'all checked your garages this afternoon. Who was rake or lawnmower or hedge trimmer you would find there? And you may well have intended to return them when you borrowed them in the first place, but now months or years later, they still reside in your shed, garage, barn, library, wherever. <laughs> We steal when we file fraudulent or exaggerated insurance claims. We steal when we slander or gossip about somebody else. You see, we're stealing their reputation and their right to an accurate representation or even to represent themselves. I heard a great story about this woman. And she goes to her preacher, this is the 16th century, and she confessed to him that she was a slanderer. And he says to her, well, is this a frequent problem? And she says, yes, Pastor, I just can't help it. And so he says, well, your fault is great, but God's mercy is greater. Here's what I want you to do. You need to go to the nearest market and find a chicken that has been recently killed but still has all its feathers. Then you are going to walk a certain distance, plucking the feathers. When you finish your work, come back to me here. And so the woman did so, and she was quite perplexed and anxious for an explanation. And the preacher replied to her, he says, ah, good. You've been faithful to the first 
first part of this task. Now, go and retrace all your steps and gather up all the feathers that you have scattered. And so the woman, distraught, replied, I cannot. I cast them carelessly on every side, and the wind carried them in every direction. How could I ever recover them all? And so the preacher replied, And so it is with your words of slander. Like the feathers, they have been scattered and cannot be recalled. Go and sin no more. One more. We steal when we pass off others' work as our own. When we steal, when we take somebody else's intellectual property without giving due credit. So, I must again remind you all that this sermon series is based on somebody else's work, Pastor Alistair Begg and his accompanying book. Please don't tell me I'm stealing. I'm doing my best. So let us conclude our discussion on this commandment with its positive side. Supposedly this is obvious. Um, I've read several pastors who would understand your honor. I didn't understand. I had to sit and stare at it. But here we are. What's the opposite of stealing? Giving. How can we demonstrate an attitude of sincere appreciation and demonstrate that we understand this concept? The opposite of stealing is giving. By giving, by demonstrating brotherly love to our neighbor and by looking out for their property, their welfare, and the good of the community. You see, 1 John 3.17 helps us with this in the instruction. If anybody has material possessions, sees his brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, meaning he doesn't help them, how can the love of God be in that person? So there it is. God has given us the finances and the resources. We need to go about helping. Whether it is a ride, moving a couch, a place to sleep, a meal, chores or projects, whatever it is, this is the opposite of stealing. And it is what we are called to as Christians in obedience to the Eighth Commandment. And summarizing these two commandments, again, we see how interrelated all the commandments are. Because when we commit adultery, we are stealing. We're stealing from our spouse their right to us, our faithfulness and commitment to keep the ones which we have intact. We steal from another spouse their right to their spouse, their relationship. When we steal someone's property, we disrespect them and God as what is theirs is given by God. And of course, we just talked about the many other ways in which we steal. So as with every sermon in this series, I found myself very, very really confronted um, with how totally depraved I am, with how much I battle with my flesh, and how quick I am to justify my own behavior, which at the heart just comes down to selfishness. And if I am not diligent, if I am not intentionally seeking the Lord, it will overwhelm me. But when I do seek the Lord's guidance and his protection and his empowering Holy Spirit, I all of a sudden find myself having, helping other people in ways I didn't expect. And so as I have said several times at this point, I don't want us to leave these series of sermons thinking, well, I'm an adulterer, I'm a thief, I'm a murderer, I'm a, I guess I should just pack it up and it was a good try. Don't think that. Repentance is the correct response to sin. Certainly, search your heart, confess your guilt, remember that for those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And so when we approach the commandments, we find guidelines for life. We find rules for freedom. In obedience to these commandments, as all ten of them, that we honor God, and we live the Christian life of freedom in Christ. Again, this is not freedom to do whatever we want, but it is freedom from the, sla from the slavery of sin and death. And so in application today, I want us to find an opportunity 
to execute the positive side of the Eighth Commandment. Find a place where there is a need that you can fill, whether through your finances or resources, resources, and do so. And today we examine the Seventh and Eighth Commandments. We discovered, as usual, there is more than meets the eye. These commandments are about our hearts and how we approach our marriages and sex within them and how we deal with lust in our imaginations and how we keep the institute of marriage sacred and sanctified as God intends. And when we steal, we are insulting the dignity of the person right down to their being as a steward of God. We are breaking God's law. And we do so in many ways that may seem minuscule, but to offend a holy God. And so as you go out this week, I pray that you, with a proper Lenten attitude, continue to examine yourselves through the lens of these commandments as we pre prepare to again celebrate Easter as the resurrection of our Savior, victorious over sin and death. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for your statutes, uh, that you have given us guidelines to live in freedom. I pray that you would help us to be quick to repent, that you would help us to keep our eyes on you, that you would help us to love each other well, to have a, a renewed understanding uh, of your intention of marriage as two become one flesh. That you would uh, give us clarity on having the integrity to not steal, uh, but rather to give generously of the finances and resources and all of the blessings that you've given us, that we would use those to bless others for your glory. We love you and we praise you. Go before us this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.